All right, so starting with ticks, we'll start with this um, again, short outline. We'll discuss the general characteristics of the ticks, hard ticks, soft ticks, and their morphology, life cycle, and medical importance. Um, the same will go to the general characteristics of the ticks, the common names, um, which is for the subfamily of arachnids. Arachnids are within very close to the families of, of uh, spiders. Um, they are mostly uh, exo exodoideas that uh, along with mites and also within the family of acarinas. And ticks are ectoparasites. Again, so this one, there will be infestation uh, of, the, of the body rather than an infection. And they usually feed blood of mammals and birds, and occasionally they can infect reptiles and amphibians. Mouth parts are usually large and a large tooth structure called hypostome that the tick used to firmly anchor itself to, to its host. And then some of the ticks also secret chemicals that act as a glue to further anchor themselves in position. So well, they usually say, literally, they also have chemicals that cement you to act like glue uh, on, the, on your body, on the body of the, the host. And, and also have sensory structures known as the hala organ, which, which uh, the hala organ is on, is on the, I'll show you images shortly, but they're on the tarsal segments of which of the working legs. These, these hala organs uh, has the anterior pit and the prox proximal capsule. Uh, you're going to zoom where you see the image of this shortly. So the hala organ is useful for them to be able to move around, to detect food, to detect humidity, to smell, and these things. So the pit region uh, is for detecting humidity, and the capsule region is used to for smell or olfaction. Right now, before we get to, yeah, so the classification, as I mentioned, Arthropoda, Arachnidas, Exodida, and the family Ex Exodidae, which are hard ticks, and Argacidae, which are soft ticks. So for you to remember, X equals to hard. Exodidae is hard ticks. Argacidae is a soft ticks. Um, that you go with. Um, now, before we get into the, to the, the families of the ticks, let me share with you this short video. Can you see the screen? Can you see the, the, the screen? Okay, good. In the summer of 2019, a bull was found dead on a farm in North Carolina, dead by exsanguination, which means it was drained of blood. The culprit wasn't real life vampires, but something just as frightening. An army of more than a thousand Asian longhorn ticks. But here's the thing, as scary as that sounds, Asian longhorns are just one of about 90 tick species found in the U.S. All of them suck blood, all of them can carry disease, and all of them are incredibly difficult to kill. The Asian longhorn tick is truly a villainous pest. Not only is it an invasive species, but it can also clone itself over and over again. Since it was first reported in 2017, it's crawled its way to at least 12 other states, including where we are here, New York. Okay, so this is a, an adult. This looks like the Asian longhorn tick to me. So this is the infamous Asian longhorn tick. Yeah. That's Danielle Tufts, a disease ecologist at Columbia University. She's studying ticks in Staten Island to figure out what diseases they carry. But first, she has to collect them. So this is what we call a drag cloth. Okay. And it's a meter by meter, so a meter squared. And basically what we would do is we just walk at a nice, even, slow pace and drag this right behind us. And we'll stop every about 20 meters or so, and we'll flip the cloth over, and we'll look for whatever ticks are on the, the backside. Contrary to what many people believe, ticks don't actively seek you out. 
Ah, so here's a tick right here. Tick spotted. So many ticks in this forest. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is a very ticky forest. And they're definitely not jumping on you from trees. In fact, ticks can't even jump. They're actually more like opportunists who take what they can get. Ticks are what we call sit and wait predators. They climb up to the top of the blades of grass and they put their, their arms out. And they're at the top of their arms, they have little kind of sticky pads. And those pads will get attracted to this. And this is how they get stuck on your pants or on other animals in the wild as well. And what do you call the like when they stick their hands up like this? We call that questing or host seeking. Yeah. Ticks are literally on a quest for blood, and they've mastered the art of extracting it, all without getting caught. After a tick crawls onto you, it sneaks into a concealed crevice like your armpit. And after that, it uses two horrifying hook-like structures to tear into your flesh and keep from falling off. Then they insert what is basically a straw covered in spikes like a piece of barbed wire, which makes them even harder to remove. And this sounds like it would hurt, a lot. But ticks have another trick up their sleeve, or rather their mouth, saliva. It's a tick's ultimate weapon to avoid detection. It contains pain-numbing properties, so you don't notice them even as they stab and rip your flesh. Plus, it suppresses your immune system, so the wound is less likely to get red or itchy. That's why ticks can stay in you undetected for days, even as they grow to several times their normal size. And if you do find a tick in time to get it off, it won't die easily. Tuff says that ticks can survive for as long as two years without a blood meal. And they're also masters of the elements. They can tolerate long periods of drought, and some species can survive underwater for two to three days. So yeah, flushing them down the toilet or sink likely won't kill them. If you put them in the sink, sometimes they'll crawl back out of the sink. Now, all of this wouldn't be such a big problem if it weren't for the diseases they carry. In the U.S. alone, they transmit at least 16 diseases to humans. That's more than any other insect, including mosquitoes. Lyme disease alone, for example, infects an estimated 300,000 Americans each year. And it's only getting worse. In 2004, there were about 23,000 cases of tick-borne disease reported to the CDC. But by 2017, that number had almost tripled to nearly 60,000. But what isn't clear is why. Why ticks and the diseases they carry are spreading. Though Tufts and other scientists say that climate change is at least partly to blame. We've been having pretty mild winters, which can um, promote survival, overwintering survival of hosts and of the vectors, which also will lead to new expansion. Whatever the reason, there are tons of ticks pretty much everywhere. So the next time you go for a hike, keep these tips in mind. Stay on the trails where ticks are less likely to hang out. Wear bug spray, preferably something with deep. Tuck your pants into your socks so nothing can crawl into your legs. Wear light clothes so anything that does get on you is easy to spot. And of course, always do a tick check once you're out of the woods. All right, so we're gonna do a tick check, which all right, so that was a, a short video, but mainly from, from the U.S., but it gives you an idea of some of the main principles around ticks and how they move around and what they eat and how they do that stuff. So we're going to, to continue to work you through the rest of the, of the presentation, and then you'll be able to uh, appreciate some of the very specific types of, of ticks. Like, and then you can get to think which one, which or the hard takes or soft take what you were seeing in the previous videos. So medical important takes are the, the hard takes include the axodes, uh, the demacenta, ambilomas, uh, hyalomas, and hemenophalysis. And the diseases that tra- they're transmitting include viral encephalitis, um, the, the tick typhus, tularemia, Q fever, and also human uh, babiosis. These are diseases that are associated with transmission uh, in in uh, hard ticks, and uh, from external morphology, hard ticks are flattened dorsoventrally, and usually have an oval in shape. Females are usually bigger than males, and both suck blood. Different from what you've seen in the fleas, uh, that only female will go. Or even mosquitoes, females suck blood, but in this case, both males and females suck blood. The capitulum, which is also known as the head. Uh, projects forward beyond the body outline. 
uh, and then it is visible from above. So if you look at the flea from the uh, top view here, so if you look at the flea from the top, you can see the capitulum, this one. This is one of the major distinguishing uh, uh, feature for hard text, okay? And so this is this is a you can, the capitulum is is visible from above, and and this distinguishes from the soft ticks with the hard ticks. The scutum, which is also known as the skin, is also seen in larva and nympho stages. The pulps or the the pulp part of the capitulum in hard ticks are usually swollen and club shaped rather than leg shaped as a soft tick. So you see this this is the pulps. Here, they look like clubs. They're swollen. These ones. The pulps for the hard ticks. So the hard ticks ni wagumu. So that's how they, they, they look like that. Uh, but the soft ticks, in contrast, you'll be able to see if I can find it. Yes. So this is an image of a soft tick. And, and the soft ticks, um, the pups are looking different. So you get it to when you see the difference. So this is these are the soft ticks. The soft ticks, you can't see the capitulum. There is no capitulum that is visible. The head is not visible. And you can even see the skin is you know wobbly and soft, while the um, uh, hard ticks are much more uh, harder skin and 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 uh, have a much more stronger looking output. So the, the, the external morphology continuing that there is a tooth hypostomes located between a pair of um, chelicerae, which is unlike the soft ticks, these chelicerae sheath are covered with the small denticles, giving them a, a chagrin, sh chagrined appearance. So see how they look? quite different from the, the soft ticks. Um, and then the posterior margin of the body in species of genera demacanta, uh, uh, rapicephalus and hemophialis is a rectangular, is that this cause rectangular indentations called the festoons. So they may not be visible in females. So these are the festoons. See this, like the rectangles. This. These are the festoons. So if you see a festoon, you know this is a heart attack um, that is within the group of either um, Demacanta, Recifela palace, and uh, Hemaphysalis. Um, and then moving forward, heart ticks have a dorsal plate called um, a shield or scutum, which is absent. Uh, in in uh, in soft ticks, so <clears throat> this is the this is a dorsal plate, or also known as the scutum. This is not present in soft ticks, or this is you can easily see it here. So it's another distinguishing feature. Um, and then the male in the male, the scutum is large and covers almost the entire dorsal surface of the body, and the female is much smaller and restricted to the anterior part of the body, just behind the capitulum. The body has four pairs of legs and terminating in a pair of claws. Uh, so this is uh, one pair, two pairs, three pair, four pairs. So these are four pairs of legs that end up in some small claws. You can see there's a little claw, and there's a claw here, and, and there's a claw here. There's a claw here. So <clears throat> the life cycle is uh, hemimetabolus, that is incomplete metamorphosis. It just goes to egg, larva, and nympho stages. It does not go through the pupa stages. So that's why it's called it's incomplete metamorphosis. The adult remains attached to the host for long periods, can go up to four weeks feeding on blood. When feeding is finished, the engorged tricks drop on the ground and seek shelter under leaves, shrubs, or berries in soil. So it goes there in a kunyonya damu, This is followed by egg laying, 
uh, uh, and then which is is formed in front of or on top of the scrotum, and only one batch of eggs in thousand, often one thousand to eight thousand, is laid, and then she dies. So comes out, eats your drinks your blood, falls down, lays eggs, dies. Life continues. So life cycle is <clears throat> this life cycle is typical of three host ticks. So this is an important feature for you to remember. The the concept known as the three host ticks or two host ticks. So life cycle that I've just mentioned is typical for a three host ticks. That is a different individual host, which may be the same or a different species that is parasitized by the larva, nymph, and adults, and molting or cow on the ground. So most hard ticks, the exodids, have this type of a life cycle. That's the, the, this is in the medically important species of three host ticks include exodus, the maqueta, and, and these other uh, two. The three hot sticks are most likely to become infected with pathogens and they're good vectors, right? So just by the fact that it can have three hosts, it can transfer diseases from one uh, animal to another compared to two host ticks or one host tick. And I'll show you shortly here in a, in a, in a, in a life cycle. So when you talk about two host ticks, that is uh, like Yaloma and, and some other species of uh, Rapicephalus, the larva in completes feeding and remains on the host and molts to nymph, which then feed in the same host. See the difference? The, the, in this two host tick, the nymph continues to feed in the same host. While in the three host tick, they will move out and go to a different species or the, uh, the, the transformation happen on the ground. Now this engorging nymph then drops off and molts off into the, and resulting into adult feeds in a different host. So this one, you will need only two hosts. All the three stages will involve um, uh, uh, two hosts. So in one host tick, such as um, the Buffila species, the larva, nymph, and adults all feed in the same host, and melting also takes place in that host. So the only stage that leaves the host is the engorge adult female sticks that drops on the ground to lay eggs. So this is uh, the, the three host cycle. Uh, for example, this is a tick. This would be, can I see, can you tell me in the, in the group, is this a hard tick or a soft tick? Is, is this one a hard tick or a soft tick? Can I, someone tell me? It's a hard tick, right? Right, so the hard tick um, will, will in, during fall season, we don't have this, this season in Tanzania. Uh, but um, it will get into uh, attaching the host in spring and then it start mating. And then it, when it comes to summer, it will fall off and then adults will start to lay eggs. And then the eggs will hatch into, into a larva and then it gets into infect another host and then continues the same life cycle and then gets another host. So this, this, it tends to be able to move between, you know, big animals, squirrels, and then rabbits to transmit diseases from, from uh, different animals. Again, so the two host life cycle is, is you probably won't be able to see this slide well, but this one will only go through the big, uh, the big animals in, in, in spring, and then we'll go to small animals in, in, the, in the next spring, and then fall goes again to the next spring, just like that. So this would be a two host tick and different stages would only be uh, available for the, the nymph will be eating on a different uh, animals compared to the three host stage. And the one host stage will just include the, the, um, the larva stage and remain the same host from the, the first nymph stage, second and third, all the same animal until they get to the diagnostic stage and continue to hatch. Right, so that's the main difference between the three host cycles and uh, the two, one host cycle and two host cycle. So medical importance of heart ticks, you have, uh, again, as I've also mentioned before, the rickettsia, rickettsii, as a Rocky Mountain spotted fever, uh, can be transmitted uh, by the, the macenta and the embelomas. Um, Butonius fever can be caused by rickettsia, conori, which is, is, is uh, principally transmitted by the dog tick. 
and spirochetes, which cause the Lyme disease, uh, uh, caused by Borrelia bugdoferi, which is another pyrochet. Spirochet uh, is transmitted by um, Ixodes. Tularemia is a bacterial disease that is caused by a Pasteurella tularensis and is transmitted by bats of hard ticks. Okay, so this is this is hard ticks, and and also you can get tick paralysis, that is called resulting from the tick saliva, which continues to bump into the host in long periods of feeding. And symptoms can appear five to seven days after the tick starts feeding. Uh, as we already said, that the saliva can also cause um, cause uh, you to immobilize and, and deceive your immune system and things like that. So the tick paralysis will also involve motor nerves and hence cannot walk and stand and difficulty to swallowing and breathing. This is much more severe version of a disease caused by ticks. This is tick paralysis. Also, there are arboviruses that are transmitted um, uh, by ticks. So all arboviruses that are transmitted by ticks, bites, uh, usually could have transovarian transmission, can also occur, which from your mother to a child, uh, but like tick-borne encephalitis, um, OMS hemorrhagic fever, Crimea Congo hemorrhagic fever, Colorado tick fever, all these, these are caused by arboviruses. And I hope you've studied in your microbiology about the arboviruses, or you will study them. So this is the soft ticks. Uh, as you've already mentioned, these are much more softer. They don't have the, the, the scutum. They don't have the, um, the festans, the rectangular festans. They are easy to differentiate between soft ticks and, and hard ticks. And these belong to the genus um, Ornithodorus. And the adults are usually flattened, uh, those of ventral flattened and oval outlined. There is no scutum or dorsal shield. As I've mentioned, the mouth parts are situated ventrally, so they're not visible dorsally. As I said, you can't see them from the top. And they have four segmented pups that are leg-like. Uh, these are the pups that are leg-like. And, and um, they, they, they have... The shelly carrier is smooth and don't denticulate, uh, so they don't have that strong teeth. The powerful cutting chelicaries have strong teeth and together with the hypostome, they penetrate the host during feeding. Uh, four pairs of well-developed legs uh, terminate in, in a pair of claws. So <clears throat> they're usually coxal organs, which are glands, and then these glands are the ones that uh, tend to uh, either reduce, re release uh, uh, secretions that help them in the feeding. The life cycle again, so again, the same context between the two hosts, three hosts uh, ticks, but a blood meal is essential for the maturation. And after every blood meal, the, the uh, soft tick usually lay eggs, four to six summer egg batches with about 10 to 1,000 egg, 200 eggs. Different from the hard ticks, hard ticks have much more number of eggs than the soft ticks. And the eggs, uh, the eggs will usually hatch within a week or so to release the six-legged larvae, which also is very active and searches for hosts to take a blood meal for about 20 minutes and then drops in the ground. After a few days, the larvae also molt in to produce eight-legged nymph. The nymph seeks out the host and feed, about, feed again for about 20 to 30 minutes and then falls in the ground again. And then um, Agassiz ticks usually have four to five nymph for instance, and up to eight nympho instars in some species. So this is this is usually every nympho stage usually requires blood meal before it can proceed to the next stage. And for those who don't understand, the nympho stage is just a stage of development. Uh, just like how you have egg, larvae, pupae, and adult, this is egg, larvae, and then you get to nymph, 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 until they go to the final adult stage. So every nympho stage would definitely need a blood meal. The distribution of, of uh, the larvae, nymph, and adults of agacitic is usually patchy and restricted to their homes, nests, and resting places of the host. Uh, for people, who, how many of you have ever seen ticks? I didn't even ask you this question. I remember when we used to uh, deal with cows, you would have a lot of ticks around the cows and the behind of the ears, uh, and, and it would be very interesting to remove them. And they're usually some of the birds will go and eat these, these ticks um, in our common language. But these are different um, 
uh, species uh, of, of ticks that will be available and eaten by, uh, by, by birds. So species that are commonly fed on man is, is on a Ornithodorus mobata complex. These are usually found in human, in, in human settlement, especially in village huts. Because of the short periods of attachment to the host, blood meals by the larva and nymph and others, the soft ticks usually feed many hosts, and usually they are referred as a multi-host ticks, different from the, the three-host tick or four-host tick, because every time the nymph stage would need to go to another, another stage uh, of development would need a, a, a meal. So uh, this is an example of adults. These are nymphs. So you could have a stage one of a nymph, stage two, stage three, stage four. And each of these stages needs a particular meal. So you have multi-host um, multi ticks. All right, so these are, these are, this is an example of a life cycle of how it, it continues to go. Adults mate and lay eggs, the kind of eggs also hatch to form a six-legged larvae, one, two, three, four, five, six-legged larvae. The six-legged larvae get to another host, the chicken, and then they, it start to feed, and then it moves to another nymph stage, uh, which is now one, two, three, four, five, six, eight-legged la, uh, nymph stage, and then feeds again, and then develops again, and then just that way until it becomes um, an adult. So tick-borne relapsing fever uh, is, is, is a common, is a medical importance of um, ornithodoras, and then uh, it can cause a disease that can transmit Borrelia dutoni. Uh, the other one was transmitting Borrelia bugdoferi. Mm. This, is, this is an agent of a tick-borne relapsing fever. Transmission is through saliva or coxofluid. It can also cause Q fever, which is rickettsia disease caused by um, uh, coxesio brunetti, transmitted through the bites of agassiz ticks. Control of ticks, usually you remove them by pulling them off the host, the, and then you, when you're removing it, you usually compress, you squish the head and then push it deeper into the host to loosen the grip of the teeth. You remember in the video that you're seeing the, that they have a, almost a, a, a very sharp, uh, with, uh, spike with spikes that if you just pull it out like this it won't happen so if you squish the head and then pull it inside to loosen the spikes and then pull it out it's easier to to remove um, and then otherwise if you don't do that you're going to leave the the head inside the tissue and this is not going to be a good thing also you can do application of the insecticides uh, into domestic animals and spray your houses and make sure you, you dip the animal domestic animals into insecticide uh, uh, bath. Tick-borne disease prevention, just stay away from the ticks. Um, and then make sure you wear protective clothing, trousers, and, and you can also contain permethrin containing insecticide, just how so you've seen in the previous video, how they were dealing with these things. And yeah, so that's that's all I wanted to share with the text real quick, and um, I hope you gathered.